Aging is a fact of life. Old is a mindset. So at the core of the NAR country approach, to go slow to go fast, go one inch mm. at a time. If you can keep progressing every time you come back, that's something special. I think having a mission is really crucial. There are three tiers of goal setting and humans perform best when all three are pointed in the same direction. But it also turns out that when all three are actualized in a mission, that's the most potent thing you can do. Peak performance is a checklist. The good news, the bad news, you gotta show up every day for that checklist. Mm. That's what you're doing. And most important on that checklist, in my opinion, is the challenge skill sweet spot. You gotta show up every day to push yourself. You know where that challenge skill sweet spot is. You know exactly how much is pushing yourself right outside your comfort zone. And that's your job on a daily basis. What does it take to do the impossible? What does, what does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, for organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again, breakthroughs. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world-leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best-selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. back to another power packed episode of Everford Radio. My name is Chase. Welcome to the show. If you're new, as always, thank you so so much for tuning in with me here today. All right. So, today's guest, Stephen Kotler, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you've read some of his amazing books, his multiple 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 bestsellers. The dude has pumped out over a dozen books now. His latest read is Nar Country: Growing Old and Staying Rad. And in this book, which, of course, I will have listed and linked for you down in the show notes to pick up your copy, he's going to break down the neurobiology of flow state, peak performance, and aging. All right, my friends, let's go ahead and jump into today's conversation with the one, the only, Stephen Kotler. Before we kind of dive into NAR country and really dial in the, the concepts of Growing old and staying rad, which I love that that phrase, the subtitle of the book, by the way. I would love if you could please kind of help us. Let's set the groundwork for some of your past work without, you know, going way down a rabbit hole and talking all things peak performance, all things flow state. But, you know, more or less, we're here to kind of talk about an old dog and new tricks. What are some of the tricks we need to be aware of first when it comes to flow state and peak performance? What, what is some like high level concepts and definitions to help the listener grab hold of Yeah, well, we got to start with flow, of course. Mm -hmm. So let's define flow for people. Um, if you're not familiar with the term runner's high, being in the zone, if you play basketball, it's being unconscious. If you're a jazz musician, you're in the pocket, the linguist sort of mm. endless. Uh, flow is a technical term, a scientific term, but all this, all the terminology, it means the same thing. It's a state of optimal performance where we feel our best, we perform our best. More specifically, it's any of those moments of rapt attention and total absorption. We get so focused on the task at hand, so focused on what we're doing, everything else just starts to disappear. Sense of self, sense of self-consciousness, the inner critic, that nagging voice in your head. Time dissipates. Goes quiet. Yeah, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. time dissipates. It'll uh, most frequently just go so sucked into what you're doing that five hours will go by in like five minutes. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, it'll slow down. You get a freeze frame effect from anyone who's been in a car crash and throughout all aspects of performance, mental and physical, go through the roof. And the only other thing I think that's probably worth mentioning is my organization, the Flow Research Collective. What do we do? Who are we? What, you know, that's sort of you stuff. made a whole thing about it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I made a whole thing about it. Um, so at the Flow Research Collective, we are uh, we're the world's leader, actually, in neuroscience based mm. peak performance research and training. So on the research side, we study the neurobiology of peak human performance, what's going on in the brain and the body mm -hmm. when people are performing at their very best. And our focus, our central focus is flow, but there's obviously more to peak performance than just flow. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit wider. And then we take what we learn and we use it to train people. And we train people in 130 different countries 
We work with everybody from kind of professional athletes and members of the U.S. Special Forces to soccer moms, soccer dads, just average everyday folks, and all the way up to companies. So Facebook, Accenture, Audi, Bain Capital, the Air Force, the San Francisco Police Department, on and on and on. And the only reason I mention all this is we're data geeks. So we measure everything we possibly can. So what this means is we have wildly diverse, like globally diverse, and deadly accurate uh, tallies on what works and what doesn't. We're training tens of thousands of people every month. So big sample size, a lot of people, global, good ideas of what works for folks, what doesn't work for mm -hmm. folks. And, um, and that's sort of it. And maybe the last thing that I'll say, because it'll help people oriented to me, uh, my interest in, in research-wise has always been in the neurobiology. And the reason is this. Um, yes, you got to listen to me say big words every now and again, but the upside is if you go into the history of peak performance, like low science is actually old. It dates back to the 1870s. And we spent the 20th century decoding the psychology. And, and in the 1990s, uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the godfather of flow psychology, and Susan Jackson, who was one of his graduate students, a sports psychologist, brilliant woman from Australia, got together. They wrote a book called Flow in Sports which was literally about, hey, we took all these psychological ideas about flow and we're trying to train athletes. And if you read that book, you'll find out that like most of the time they weren't very good at getting people into flow. Mm -hmm. And it's not their fault. It's that psychology is a bad tool for it. The psychology is super individual. Key things in peak performance, like where are you on the introversion to extroversion scale, right? Or what are your risk tolerances? That's totally individual, right? It's, some of it's genetic, some of it's set up by early childhood experience, but yours mm -hmm. is very different from mine. Right. So one of the things that happens that you see in peak performance, people will figure out what it works for me and they'll try to teach it to other people and as a general rule, they fail. Like they may be able to teach it to other people, but other people, they try to apply it. It doesn't get them where they want to go. Why? Because it was super individual. It was right. sort of customized yeah, yeah. for you. Yeah. Neurobiology, you go one level down, that's shaped by evolution. It's mm -hmm. shared by all humans. So why does our stuff work in 130 countries? Why is it reliable and repeatable? It's because we're, we've taken it a level down to the neurobiology, which is shared. So that, and I'm going to punch out the mic stand. <laughs> That's part of flow state. Part you of flow state. I get so excited I punch out the mic stand. Micro <laughs> chaos every, every, everywhere. <laughs> um, so yeah, those are, I, I think is from, I mean, I'm happy to go anyplace else, but I think like, from place to start, you want to know mm -hmm. some stuff about me that sort of sets the table. Perfect. That'll tell you. Yeah, and what I love about that interpretation, thank you, is that it, it reminds me of this other concept that has kind of been the through line for me in my life now, you know, getting into my late 30s, but also, you know, six years of doing this show and, and having a variety of people on about physical fitness, nutrition, optimization, entrepreneurship, relationships, um, all the ways in which I feel are important. And I say, you know, help us live a life ever forward. The same through line I'm hearing is that basically at the end of the day, like kind of everything works because at the end of the day, we're all humans. We all have very, very similar, if not the same at some level, biology. We can always count on a human being human at some base level. So if we can understand that, apply it to whatever our thing is, whatever the application might be, that's really, you know, kind of jumping to the finish line, I think a little bit, or, or at least just giving yourself a little bit of leg up. No, matter no what I agree. And is. in fact, I was, as you were talking, and I don't know if this is true, so I'm just going to make a statement, but I think if you were to look at most of the stuff that we're actually doing at the collective, mm -hmm. I don't even know if it's human, it's mammalian. Um, you know oh. what I mean? Like when I say stuff is old, Interesting. we, so animals can get into flow. So we're you talking into, kingdom now, not um, just, yeah, we've, I've moved. Right, I'm, yeah, right, exactly. Right, <laughs> well done. Okay, right. Um, so, uh, yeah, so d dogs can get into flow. I wrote about that mm -hmm. in my book, small furry prayer. People get into flow with horses. There's cross species mm -hmm. flow. Mm -hmm. Um, so the state, this most, yeah, all like social, an avatar too. We have to just take our braid and connect it to the horse, right? That's how we get into flow state. That's exactly right. It's I knew it. Elon. I knew it. So I good to it. see you again. I knew it. <laughs> if it were that easy, I feel like I, I, a lot of people would. I'd probably try that out. I don't know. If there's like some kind of like, if you could literally have a human. I saw Existence. I'm a Cronenberg <laughs> fan. I'm in. Sign me up. I don't know. I, I don't know about the I scene digress. in the Chinese restaurant. I don't want to kill the waiter. <laughs> Could I, if we can if we can do it out, me having to kill the waiter, I'm I'm in. If I got to kill the waiter. I got to think about it. I'm not trying bit. to kill anybody. That's for damn sure. That's what I'm but, saying. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> there is That's definitely right. 
this like, you know, animal kingdom, human and, you know, any kind of other mammal, I think connection that if we just think about for a second, like we've all probably been there or can at least witness in like a, you know, in the zoo or in, you know, like, you know, horse therapy, you know, at least for sure. Yeah. Equine therapy is a really great example mm-hmm. of cross species, right? It's, that's, it's sort of at the heart of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so like when I think, when I talk about stuff that's old and evolutionary conserved, I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff I do that's uniquely human, but I think a lot of it yeah. is, is mammalian, which is mm-hmm. sort of one of the reasons I think it works so effectively mm-hmm. for so many people. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to rein it in here a little bit, but I, I love, I love the, uh, the levels to which this can go. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, so at its core, when I was reading NAR country and uh, I think a lot of your new work now, I should say new application of a lot of your, your lifetime of work is we're talking about, you can't teach an old dog, new tricks. Um, and that you quite literally proved is kind of not the case. (laughs) If we can have this baseline understanding of our biology, neurobiology. So I guess my first question in, in this case is why park skiing, why this level of physical and mental application and pushing the limits of both someone in their fifties, like, why was this the thing? Um, so I've always been an action sport athlete, mm-hmm. skier, surfer, and et cetera. And whatever action sport I happened to be doing at the time, um, that's always my laboratory where the, where ideas, I'm, I'm, you know, what I'll, I'll take something into the mountains of the ocean or whatever, see if it works for me, see if it works for friends of mine. If it does, um, I'll say, okay, maybe there's something here, or maybe this is personal and psychological, but like now let's run greater experiments. So you kind of go real world, see I go, what's out I, there. Yeah, and then I, I go always real clinical. world, real world first. Interesting. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's very backwards from how I appreciate most, that approach. Yeah, yeah. How most science is yeah. done. Most science sort of starts with the, hypothesis and, and mm-hmm. works forward. And um, that's just never been how I've done it. I've always sort of, here's the thing that happened. Why did it happen? Mm-hmm. How did it happen? How do I get more of it? How do I get less of it? Um, is this just me? Is this individual? Is this a psychology thing like we mentioned? Can or I duplicate is this, this or not? Or is this going to work for other people? Is it, you know, and then you got to start asking, is it just men? Is it men and women? It, like all those kinds of questions start to really matter. Is it just gophers? Is it just gophers? Because there's a lot that's just gophers. There's a Caddyshack joke here that I can't get to, but it's there. Just a baby Ruth. Just a baby Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just tanking my own show. But That's all right. But like, keep going. Your banter is appreciated here. Um, uh, we've kind of already talked about this. I was going to bring up, you know, the aspect, you know, defining flow state a lot is, you know, you talk about challenge skills, balance is flow's most important trigger and how flow follows focus. Um, were you aware when you're stepping into your skis and onto the mountain doing all these things, were you really top of mind aware of these concepts? And was that driving your experience? Were you like, okay, flow follows focus. So let me tap in. Let me focus so, so that I no, can really No, but get the other one. So, okay. So, um, you asked to, let me put some context around what I did in the experiment and then mm-hmm. we'll actually go back. Cause you were talking okay. about the challenge skills balance. So okay. that's the answer to the question that you're asking. So, uh, I chose park skiing uh, because um, there are the general feeling of park skiing is if you haven't learned by the time you're 30, 35, it's going to be really difficult. And at 40, 45, mm-hmm. that's impossible. And by the time you're 50, or I started when I was 53, you're crazy. Mm-hmm. Is the like that's the standard answer? Kind of like it's, death wish kind of thing. Yeah, there and there are 11 or 12, depending on how you're counting them, different biological reasons why supposedly mm-hmm. learning to park ski at that age is completely impossible and um you know and there, there's a bunch of stuff in my field flow science and a couple of the related fields that said no no this is not true and old dogs can absolutely learn new tricks and they'll be better at learning new tricks than, than younger dogs even mm. but how you train people differs mm-hmm. and where it differs the most is with the challenge skills sweet spot so let me okay. back it up and give put a context around it and then we'll walk through it um Flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow, as you mentioned. Um, flow follows focus, as you also mentioned. So that's what all the triggers do. They drive attention into the present moment. There are 26 known triggers. There are probably way more, but that's what we've discovered. Science has discovered so far. 
and uh, 26 known triggers to for flow for flow. Okay. Yeah. There are 12 or 13, depending on who you're counting on the individual side. And then there's a shared, a collective version of a flow state. So it could be this group flow or interpersonal flow. Me and you talking, okay. we get so sucked in the conversation a couple hours oh, go yeah, by yeah. that's interpersonal mm -hmm. flow, group flow, fourth quarter comeback in basketball or football, right? Or a band coming together and like they're really jamming. Like every contributing factor person is working. Is reliant, right? It's a take group flow or team flow is literally defined as a team performing at the best. Okay. Like optimal team performance. And then you can go to scale. Communitas is flow at scale. So you go to a rock concert yeah. uh, and you get everybody sort of like merges with the band and we're all clapping yeah, and yeah, singing, yeah. right? That's Communitas. It's flow at scale. So there are 13, 14, 15 triggers for uh, group flow and, and, and 12 for individual flow that have been discovered the most, they all do work the same way. They all work by driving attention in the present moment. Neurobiologically, they're doing some different things, but that's what's really happening. They're driving attention to the now. The most important is what you mentioned. It's the challenge skills balance. So the idea is I pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of the task slightly exceeds my skill set. So you want oh, to stretch, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but not snap. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of things that are sort of important here. One... On the other side of flow state, we are more complex. We're more adaptable because you're pushing on your skills. So you're learning. It's sort of built in, right? We're more complex. We're more adaptable. Uh, we actually, uh, wisdom accrues, expertise accrues in flows. Uh, for these reasons, a lot of people, including me, Hachik Samihai, the god of father of flow psychology, has argued that actually flow is one of the engines of adult development. How do we become mm. adults? How do we grow up? It, on the other side of flow states, we're more complex, we're more adaptable, we're wiser, we're more empathetic. These, as in, like um, it's an evolutionary kind of trait. That in it, flow is an evolutionary trait. And the mm -hmm. argument for there are a bunch of different arguments about where it comes from. One of the most famous is that flow is a signal of mastery. When you oh. have mastered a bunch of skills and they all come together in a new way, that's flow. And that really matters from a peak performance to aging perspective. That's we'll talk about really that. Really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, so the thing that we realized is this. So in normal folks, that challenge skills sweet spot, the difference between challenge and skills is roughly, this is a metaphor, this isn't science, but mm -hmm. metaphorically about 5%. So we have the best chance of dropping to flow when the challenge of the task is about 5% greater than the skills we're bringing to it. So 5%. Is that a lot? That doesn't seem like no, a lot. No, it's not a okay, lot. Yeah. In fact, uh, for now, if you are shy, if you are timid, if you're risk averse, mm -hmm. you're outside your comfort zone. Not a lot, but mm -hmm. just outside your comfort zone. Um, the opposite for like, when I work with entrepreneurs, or type A types, hard chargers, they're gonna check challenges that are 20, 30, 40% greater than their skills simply because it wakes them up, right. right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's really key actually. So we know from the science of motivation, I talk about this in, in Art of Impossible, uh, properly set high, hard goal, will boost motivation by 11 to 25%. Mm. So it's important. You want those high heart goals. You just need to chunk it down so that what's in front of you is about 5%. So the thing you're doing right here, right now, it fits in that sweet spot. But the overall goal can be that big, right? Just mm. what you're doing right here, right now. Now, what changed, what we started to realize is, so I have to, we're going to talk about peak performance aging, but mm. let's be clear on a couple of things. Aging is a fact of life. Old is a mindset, and old is a mindset that sets up early. That's a note. That's a note. That's a note. We're getting there. We're getting um, there. Lower. Right, and it's a mindset yeah. that sets up early. So the minute the voice in your head mm. starts saying things like "You're too old for this shit," and for a lot of us, that's in our twenties, mm -hmm. right? Um, now you're now you're and huge impact on performance, on vitality, on longevity, on health. Like really, really uh, a big issue. Once that mindset starts setting up. For sure, uh, that challenge skill sweet spot starts to shrink, mm. and it go it gets and it shrinks also because of what's known as allostatic load. Allostatic mm. load is literally the impact of stress over time, right, on our psychology and our physiology. And we realized at the Flurry Research Collective that once you get people past a certain age, and really uh, in a lot of cases it's early thirties, mm. um, that sweet spot has shrunk from like five percent down to about 1%. So at the wow. core of the NAR country approach, is go slow to go fast, go one mm. inch at a time, right? So when I was learning how to park ski- Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Yeah, for, mm. if you want to use the mm. special spec, mm. spec ops mm. uh, phrase. 
Um, yeah, and we so we were like, we're going to start with established motor patterns, something you can do 100% of time with zero fear, no constant interference, and build on top of that very, very, very slowly. And it ended up working because flow massively amplifies progression. Right. One of the things yeah. that happens yeah. in the state is learning goes through the roof, right? And studies run by the U.S. military, soldier and flow learn 240 to 500% faster than normal. So a huge boost in learning. Mm -hmm. So you end up going slow to go fast, right? In That's why we do so yeah. many, uh, you know, um, live fire training exercises and, you know, real world training exercises outside of just like, hey, here's your weapon, here's a tactic, here's a maneuver, compartmentalize, figure it out in your brain. No, they're like, okay, here, go do the shit. That's how you're not going to get in flow state in the classroom. You got to be out in the field. Super true. So that's the challenge skills balance really does has a huge role wherever you are in your life for peak performance um, mm -hmm. and uh, changes a little bit over time. And depending on what your psychology is like, it, you know, it can start shrinking in your 20s and your 30s um, and definitely by your 40s and 50s. So it changes the way you approach flow. And this is so this is one of the key points, like. Our ability uh, to get into flow is crucial for peak performance, crucial for peak performance aging, but it diminishes over time. Mm. So you have to train it um, a little bit, like most of the other skills I talk about in our country. So I'll stop there. Yeah. And I'll let you ask no, that's that fascinating. Question. And like I said, you're kind of getting to a point I definitely want to cover, uh, you know, is, is this um, sense of, of, you know, still being a radical person and, you know, pushing your limits and getting deeper into different flow states, is it more mental? Is it physical? Is it all in our mind? You know, is it really just an age related thing? But before I do, I want to go back to that, that 5% aspect. That's mm -hmm. really intriguing for me. It's intriguing for me to kind of like wrap my head around how do I actually quantify? How do we quantify? Okay. I'm going to push myself 5%. What, it, what does 5% really look like? It's for most of us, it looks like going slower than we hmm. used to go at. It is actually like that's in my experience, it's a little under um, actually letting off the gas. pedal. Yeah. For me, it's uh, it's about letting off the gas pedal. Mm -hmm. But it uh, for a lot of us, it works well because our expectations for ourselves are so extreme that letting off the gas pedal is actually we're still tied to expectations. Yeah, the work is, in front it, of us. is is useful okay. here. Um, and what, so it's really hard to measure. And that's why I said this is not science. The original uh, idea came from Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the godfather of flow psychology, sat down with a Google mathematician, and they worked it out. I heard about it from Csikszentmihalyi, and he wasn't serious about it. He was just like, this is just a guess. We, tr we took it and tried to run experiments on it, and we started uh, downhill mountain biking. The track is set, so the height, the jumps, they're this height, mm -hmm, right? They're mm -hmm. this distance. Mm -hmm. Like you could measure everything mm -hmm. and you could sort of, you could grade it that way. And that wasn't a real experiment. It was mm -hmm. a summer long. Uh, well, that, that is just math, yeah. you know, at certain rate, yeah. certain weight, you know, no, this it, angle it, of the jump. It was, yeah. and, but it, it varies a little bit, but here was the cool thing we noticed. So most people hear that and go, oh, wow, I'm going, I'm going to end up going slower. Mm. It is true, but you know what didn't happen? Nobody plateaued, and they stayed in that one that 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 sweet talent skill sweet spot. And that's what. It, it, yes, they were progressing a little slower than normal, but there's no there's no flat line. So in in skiing and mountain biking in these in these seasonal action sports, what you tend to see is people make a lot of progress at the front end of the season, right? Yeah, and then at the back end of the season, right? And they flatline for a lot of the middle. Um, what we saw with this, and it's not written in stone, but mm. I have used it a lot, and I've seen this repeatedly, is that you don't plateau. Mm. You just so you're going slower than you want to go. Sounds amazing. But in the end, you're right. I mean, you're not plateauing, mm. which is really a huge deal. If you can keep progressing every time you come back, that's something special. Okay, how do I quantify doing five percent more, pushing myself five percent beyond my known? And capabilities and certain, versus just kind of, okay, I can let off a little bit. And there's certain places where like weightlifting, mm. there is no, I mean, like what the hell does that mean? I certainly can't add five. I mean, every time I go back to the gym, I can go 5% harder. Are you kidding? My bench would be 
500 miles. Progressive right? overload does like, reach a point of diminishing return. Absolutely, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't. I'm tapped out, and I can just <laughs> yeah, stay tapped out yeah. for a while, right? Truly, um, yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> there are certain situations where, like, it doesn't even mm. make sense that way, which is why I said, again, it's a metaphor. It's a way mm -hmm. of thinking about these things much more. But it's a, the, to me, it's the most useful metaphor I've encountered. Um, again, to kind of go back a little bit to uh, the biology aspect, um, I, I got some notes. I just want to make sure I hit, hit some points here. You In the book, this is a direct quote from your work, uh, getting our biology to work for us rather than against us, you say. So let's talk our aging biology. Most of us are going to be old. There's no getting around that for a lot longer than our ancestors and quite possibly a lot longer than we ever expected. I think we all can agree that, you know, we're aging. Well, any listener to the show, I'll say we're aging better, more resilient, um, and living longer and higher quality of lives. So research shows we can sustain peak performance further into life than anyone thought possible. Over the course of later decades, there are fundamental shifts in how the brain processes information. Our ego starts to go quiet and our perspective starts to widen. So how do you want to spend that time? I love that you brought up this concept of like ego as, as we're aging and kind of understanding, you know, the biological implications there. Um, and then also better understanding our perspective. How maybe right now, instead of waiting until we're in our 40s or 50s, how can we maybe to tap into a better state of flow, let go of ego a little bit more and then, you know, open up that perspective? Or is it a matter of biology? So yes, you know, let me let me let me just speak to uh, the quote, and then we'll mm -hmm. work our way back to your question. <clears throat> quote, high level, old idea around aging, traditional idea most of us sort of grew up with. Mm. It's what I like to call the long, slow rot theory. Mm. It's right. All of our mental skills, our physical skills, they decline over time. There's nothing we can do to stop the slide. The new theory. And that, by the way, was the dominant theory up to about 1995. And starting mm. in 95, 96, whole started showing up in that research. By now, here we are, you know, about 30 years later. Holes being what? People are actually yeah, living a lot uh, longer? Uh, no, uh, just experiment. Contradictions in the data. Okay, oh, that's okay. not true. Oh, that's not true. I'll give you a couple of examples. What we now know is while our skills do decline over time, mm -hmm. and they start young, they start in their 20s, right? Some For some of us, um, all of them are user or lose it skills, including flow, right? Mm -hmm. I said our ability to flow matters over time, but mm -hmm. our ability to get there declines over time. Almost everything is this way. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll give you a simple example, VO2 max, because mm -hmm. VO2 max um, was one of everybody's favorite examples for like why peak performance aging was impossible. VO2 max upper mm -hmm. range of uh, aerobic capacity starts dropping around 25, really starts to fall off a cliff at 50. And they thought, well, there's nothing you can write. It's just age. When they measure the VO2 max of 80 year old octogenarian triathletes, they find on average, they have the VO2 max of a healthy 35 year old. No shit. Yeah. Wow. So that was one. Uh, strength is another example mm -hmm. like this. And, but a lot of it is the cognitive function too. So that's the first half. That wasn't your question. The mm -hmm. second half of your question is this. Um, what happens as we enter our 40s and 50s in the ego quiets, then what you were talking about is there are actually, there are genetic shifts and there are shifts in how the brain works. In our late 40s is when they start to come on. And in our 50s, we gain access to whole three new levels of intelligence that are pretty much off limits before then, whole new levels of creativity wow. and not just creativity, but divergent thinking, which is outside the box mm -hmm. thinking the hardest aspect of creativity to train and becomes yours mm -hmm. free of charge in your fifties, you gain way more empathy. So that's that ego starting to quiet mm -hmm. and way more wisdom. And wisdom is a very specific neurobiological trait. We know what it is. It's basically it's emotional intelligence writ large mm -hmm. is, is one way to think of it, but you gain access to all this stuff in your fifties. So can you gain access to that stuff earlier? Not that stuff because that's brain changes and genetic mm. changes. But to answer your question, as we, as, as we know, um, if you're trying to get your ego out of the way, you know, mindfulness is your, is your tool. That's, you know, that's, that's really your tool. Um, different kinds of mindfulness for different situations, but like, calm the ego down a bit that's really 
sort of one of the better tools. Get some, mm-hmm. get some just get a little bit of distance from, mm-hmm. from yourself. Or uh, the book that did it for me was uh, "Ego Is the Enemy." Ryan Holiday's mm-hmm. Ryan's book on ego. Yeah. Um, that for that for me was a uh, probably the first, if maybe maybe the second book in um, I'll call it you know self help. My my journey to personal development. You know, besides the physical aspect, uh, that book for me was just like wow. <coughs> I'm kind of like. It, you know, I never thought I was an egotistical guy or a self-centered guy, but that book showed me, I think, every human being, this the, the hidden ways that we are all actually very ego-driven. Um, and it just yeah, it completely, completely got my mind thinking about ego in my 20s still, which I'm very grateful for. But I, I do agree that I, I think most people in their 40s and 50s kind of say that same thing. One of the things that's really – so I just told you what happens to your brain in your late 40s and your 50s. Mm. Not automatic. So mm. this is interesting. So it's not just like you hit an age milestone. No, there are, uh, with adult development, and this is what we're talking about mm-hmm. essentially, there are uh, moderators, a psychological term that's a fancy word for an if-then condition. Okay. Right? Okay. So if you want these superpowers of aging, I, one of the things I said we said earlier is peak performance aging starts young, mm-hmm. right? Mindset of old sits up early, so does peak performance aging starts young. Um, if you want to just thrive throughout the course of your life. There's certain things you got to do by certain periods. By age 30, it's, you really sort of need to solve the crisis of identity. Mm. You got to know who you are. What are your strengths? What are your beliefs? What are your virtues? Who you are, who you are right. not. Who, you're, who are you not? Very good point. Um, by 40, you sort of need what economists call match fit or a tight link between who you are mm-hmm. and what you do with most of your time. You need to live in such a way as to generate lots of passion, lots of purpose, flow. Mm-hmm. All this stuff really, really matters. Um, and, you know, you usually need match fit to get at that. And that's one of the reasons you need identity by 30 is because you need this by 40. If you don't know who you are, then you don't know how to uh-huh. find, right? There you and go. then by yeah. 50, and this is where the ego stuff comes back and really bites people in the ass, and this is wild. By 50, we have to forgive ourselves we have to forgive others who have done us wrong. So forgiveness starts to really matter. And the reason is all the superpowers that become ours, they all sort of come off these new kinds of intelligence that we get. All the intelligence is about multi-perspectival thinking. Mm-hmm. It's about being able to see things from other mm-hmm. people's perspectives. If you're too egotistical, if you can't mm-hmm. forgive others, then you're not going to see things from other people's Empathy, point of view. Empathy, exactly. attunement. Yeah. And so it'll, it'll block the intelligence block the creativity, it blocks that empathy and mm-hmm. blocks that wisdom. So you don't get any of this stuff if you can't uh, really start to free. And then there's there's more stuff to do in your 50s and 60s and 70s to hang on to that stuff, but I'll, I'll just stop there. You know, that, uh, that gets me thinking about something um, really, uh, really unique. I wasn't prepared for this, but I would love to kind of caveat real quick. Uh, but real quick, are we um, good on this camera? We're good, okay. Um, all right, so you were just talking about how these kind of mile markers in age, the human experience, uh, if we are appropriately aware of the age that we're in uh, mentally, physically, biologically, there are certain kind of works to be done to set us up for the most amount of success possible in the next decade. What if we, I don't want to say like jump to the head of the line here, but a lot of this stuff, I, I think where we are now in the world, or at least in a lot of the conversations I'm having, I feel like we can begin to do a lot of that work oh, sooner. I think, yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I don't think you want, I mean, first of all, if you're waiting to 30 to solve the crisis of uh-huh. identity, um, that's probably, prob- I mean, you can do it, and a lot of people do, but it can be problematic from a career, we, like we start to figure out our mm-hmm. careers in our 20s, and if you don't sort of know who you are, mm-hmm. finding you know that career that's going to really work by 40. So I think there's a lot of advantages, and certainly when it comes to forgiveness of self and other, oh my God, don't like, don't. I mean, especially because we know that's a really simple one. Loving kindness meditation, compassion meditation, is 90%. This isn't again not science metaphor, but, right? But 90% of the challenges we're going to face around forgiveness it's the tool for the job, mm. right? There's so much data. Richie Davidson's group at Madison has done a phenomenal job with the research and compassion meditation. We, we know all about it. If you've never done it, if meditation is even in your thing, 
it's so much easier because it's a script, mm. right? All you're doing is running a Truly. script, yeah, absolutely, right? Yeah. So yeah. anybody can do it. In fact, let me call upon this program in my yeah, exactly oper- operating system. It, it, yeah, and like the good news about it, like I've gotten it. I'll do it. I'll run the script sometimes when I'm hiking my dog or driving mm. my car. Like it's not like other kinds of meditation where you can't sort of do it with okay. with, with I. You can do it and get maybe not a hundred percent of the effect, mm. but a, a good chunk of it, and it. It sort of does its work automatically. It, it, it impacts the the way the temporal parallel junction, which mm-hmm. is sort of the part of the brain that does perspective taking, mm-hmm. physical perspective. Like when okay. you, like I'm sitting over here, if I move to the side of the room, your side of the room, I have a different physical perspective. Right, right. That does it there, and it does it emotional and psychological mm-hmm. and intellectual perspective. So that's all. The, and it actually is the same part of your brain that goes haywire and out-of-body experiences, mm. which is a crazy radical shift in perspective. Been there a few right? times, yeah. Um, and usually it's a, in a life threatening situation, it's your body trying to like shift perspective really quickly to save your ass. Mm-hmm. First time I ever had an out of body experience was the first time I jumped out of a plane and went skydiving and I like <laughs> jumped out of the plane <laughs> and just floated right out of my body. And I'm looking back at my body and I'm like, I don't think this is, this was like, I got to get back there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like, this was long before I knew there was yeah. such a thing as out of body experience. Like none of this, I was like 17 years old growing Damn. up in Ohio. I had never heard of out of body experiences or anything like that. I was like. Um, what the hell is so you're experiencing out here? something you didn't even know was a thing. It is so a thing. Even yeah, more I had trippy. no idea. I had wow. no idea. Wow. And for a, wa- a long time, I wouldn't talk about it because, oh yeah, yeah you know, an out of body experience. three months to talk about my first out of body experience. Yeah. I yeah. mean, like I just, you're all going to think I'm crazy or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm going to end up in a mental I didn't even tell my wife. Yeah. yeah. It was just like, how the fuck do I process what I just I've felt? Seen, yeah, yeah. I've since done tons of work on it because out of body experiences are really common and flow. Mm-hmm. So I had, this is one of the reasons I know mm-hmm. this is the part of the brain uh, that gets, gets scrambled. I had fascinating because it shows up and flow so much. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, there's a Gallup survey that says, 20% of the population has either had a near death or an out of body experience. Mm. So it's a widely, you know, experienced phenomenon, but a lot of people don't talk about it, obviously. Damn. That's uh, well, thank you for kind of sharing your experience with that. Um, let me see, where do I want to go next here? You know, kind of, kind of on the, the same, same hand we're talking about here um, and being aware of where we are in this decade now and where we're inevitably going to go, you know, hopefully tomorrow uh, we all get tomorrow and we get next year as well, next decade. Um, another excerpt from your book here is getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. Um, so let's talk our aging biology, which we kind of were just hitting on. There. Well, let me, so let me give you a P performance example and then I'll give you an aging example. Okay. Okay. Cause, uh, this is, I, this is just a definition of peak performance. Mm-hmm. Peak performance is getting our biology to work for us rather than against mm-hmm. us. And it's not my, de- it's, I mean, I, I coined those particular phrases, but like, this is not a new idea. Mm-hmm. You go back to a hundred years ago, William James was the godfather of psychology, mm-hmm. wrote the first psychology textbook. In that textbook, it says the most important thing in any education is to get our nervous, to make our nervous system our ally instead of our enemy. Mm-hmm. Nervous system meaning brain and body, right? So this is not a, a lot new more idea. of that right now. <laughs> yeah, shit. not a new idea. And we talked about flow triggers, right? I'll give you another flow trigger, complete concentration of flow trigger. We know mm-hmm. flow follows focus. So obviously complete concentration is a flow trigger. So what does that mean biologically? Well, when I talk about complete concentration, one, if you want to concentrate, practice distraction management, this is getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. Why? Because we are not more powerful than our cell phones. Our cell phones are designed to resemble uh, slot machines in, in how mm-hmm. they work with our mm-hmm. attention, right? The most distracting, addictive thing ever invented. We're not going to beat that. So practice distraction management ahead of time. When you want complete concentration for flow, turn off the cell phone, turn off email, turn off instant messages, turn all that, all that stuff, right? Because we can't beat that. Give you a second example that's a little slightly different. How long should you focus? is a question I get asked. Mm-hmm. And What's the sweet spot? So this is interesting. The sweet spot is 90 to 120 minutes. Why? It's more than We're, I was expecting. Yeah. Why is that? Well, we know, you know you have a REM sleep cycle that lasts 90 minutes to 120 minutes. Wow, there it is. We okay. have an okay. inverse. That's uh-huh. a sleep cycle. We have a waking focus cycle that's the exact same length. So the brain, so I was telling Matching you, a we, brainwave state. Exactly. When we train people, we like, look, start by starting. Flow is this massive mm. studies written by McKinsey, the business consultancy. They wanted to know how exa- how 
more productive are executives in flow than out of flow. They spent 10 years doing this study. Average was 500% more productive in flow. 500% more? More productive. Wow. It's huge. Flow is a step function worth of change. Wow. So this is the big deal of flow because this is biologically hardwired into all humans, all mammals. We just Mm -hmm. talked about are most Mm -hmm. mammals, right? So this comes, everybody listening to this can get into flow and can use this. And this is a step function worth of change. And it's not learning 240 to 500% faster than normal creativity in studies. We ran Harvard university of Sydney in Australia, 400 to 700% spike happiness, well-being, overall life satisfaction. They all spike empathy, wisdom, and these are huge spikes. This is optimal performance. It comes built in. My point about the 500% more productive is people hear this and they're like, I don't have 90 minutes for complete concentration, right? Like screw you, Steven. I want, right. Mm. One, you end up getting so much time back. Two, start by starting, mm. right? Start by 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Don't, you know, but build, you can, it's much easier to build up to 90 or 120 minutes because we have this biological, we're getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. So that's just sort of an example there. How does this happen as we age? Here's a really uh, simple example. So older adults, who experience incredibly powerful emotions uh, live longer and healthier lives than those who do not. And one of the reasons is when we experience very, very powerful positive emotions, we boost production of T cells, which fight disease, and then natural killer cells, which target tumors and other sick cells. So real peak performance aging message there. Yeah, and this is what you talk a lot about in examples of when people most likely are in flow state and they don't maybe realize it, they're with other people and they're having these high emotional states. Oh, yeah, how do you want to... Uh, yeah, want so it's the like... sense it, of control. If you're is, trying to get into it, just recall maybe, you know, when maybe you were in it, you didn't realize it, you were having this heightened emotional experience with a loved one, you know, in a fun event, you know, on a kind of once-a-lifetime trip kind of thing, and then just, you know, mirror that in what you want to apply now. Most of us, we tend to remember our flow states. Mm-hmm. Flow, there's, we talked about the huge spike in learning and memory. It's a, it's an, it comes down to neurochemistry. So uh, neurochemicals are multi-tools. They do a bunch of different things in the brain. One of the main things they do, though, is they tag experience. It's important to mm-hmm. save for later. So one of the, how does learning and memory work? The more neurochemicals that show up during a given experience, the better chance it's going to move from short-term holding to wow, long-term wow. storage. Flow, huge neurochemical thumb. Five mm-hmm. of the most potent reward chemicals. And flow appears to be the only time we get all five at once. Mm. We remember our flow states, right? So you think back on your positive experiences in your life, unless they're like directly tied to either the, the fulfillment of a long-term goal mm. or a wedding, a birthday, a, you know, a historical mm. thing, chances are you were in a flow state. Mm. If it's not those first two things, chances are if you remember it, you were in a flow state. Um, because of how because of how that works, and we tend to remember those things. So I have no idea how I started down this train. Oh, I was coming off of what you said, but I'll stop mm-hmm. there and let you ask your next question. It, it kind of makes me think about your experience in, in all of this in in our country and kind of this <coughs> park skiing experiment you were conducting on yourself and you know with other people. I, I wonder what new states of flow state did you experience were you able to tap into um, knowing what you know and then you know kind of pushing yourself now this five percent more if not even more um, can you recall any unique new or variances of flow state in this new application no but i will tell you it's not new new is i don't know about new but i will tell you one of the things that shocked me a lot from the our country experiment so i said flow states have triggers Novelty is a flow trigger. Mm-hmm. And so uh, exploratory mode on the mountain, right? When you just like, I'm skiing, I'm part mm-hmm. skiing, but I'm going to go someplace new, see something new. That became such a go-to. Like whenever... Um, like a new trail. New well, yeah. Park, and so or- like whenever I was overtaxed right okay. i pushed too hard and i was too much anxiety and i'm blocking flow mm-hmm. that way or uh whenever i got injured right stuff is going to happen along the way you're trying to learn to park ski um rather than just sort of giving up oh i got injured i'm going to go home mm-hmm. i would often sort of like chill out a little bit till like the ache is gone and then use novelty mm-hmm. as a flow trigger and what so 
novelty always works as a flow trigger. It's great, but I was so surprised in like acute situations how well it worked. That was mm. what was surprising. What do you mean by like, that? Meaning like my body could feel like absolute hell, right? And even my brain could feel mm. bad. And yet novelty was so powerful that, you know, just mm. being in those fresh environments. So that was, some of this stuff that was learned Absolutely. along the way with NAR was like about how power, even this other, the diminished challenge skills sweet spot, right? One, one inch at a time. That doesn't sound particularly powerful. It was unbelievably powerful. That was the weird thing about NAR country is, you know, when I set out to look, teach myself at a park ski, I figured it would take five years, minimum, mm -hmm. right? Like, okay. So going I, in, you had kind of had that expectation I, time. I right? didn't, well, going in, most people thought it would never happen at all. And I was mm -hmm. going to kill myself. I thought if it happened, it was going to take about five years. That, I, so, and to track progress, I made a list. There were mm -hmm. 20 tricks that covered zero to intermediate as a, as a skill set. Um, and when I started, which, I- Which had the most- Gnarly names, gnarly by the names. way. I was cracking up reading some of these. Some of the it's even more funny when you actually describe them because some of them are so spot on. I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Others, I'm like, how did you get from <laughs> there to there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, by the way, there's six or seven. I guess that makes uh, me then a, no, there's a, a Joey, whole, right? No, well, there's a whole bunch. Of, I mean, there's a whole bunch of like, there's a whole bunch of stuff in Park Skin where mm. no, like it's got a crazy name and nobody even knows where the name came from. Like, thing grabs and you're like, why It just is started. That? Nobody yeah. knows where. No, why. there's a grab. There's a Japan grab. In, uh, in 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 skiing you would think i still to this day i'm like okay well it's obviously one of the japanese japan. skiers yeah. did it first right but i have no idea and we just call it a japan grab like nobody has a clue like I, maybe somebody does huh. right and there's a bunch of stuff like that where you're like what is this mm. why are we calling this it's what um that'll definitely get the, you out of flow state maybe don't think so hard are, about the names know, some of the names are just absurd <laughs> too because you know, yeah, absolutely again action sport cracking me up are, are absurd with their how they name things did um, did humor play a role with novelty with you did humor play a role in humor you know, kind of pushing plays you plays a role for me so um here i'll give you another example about uh here's a humor here's it so Challenge skills sweet spot we talked about mm -hmm. before, right? And uh, if I were to talk about that emotionally, I'd say it sits on the midpoint between boredom, not enough stimulation here, I'm not paying any mm -hmm. attention, and anxiety. Whoa, way too, too much. Too much, yeah. Right? And the truth of the matter is uh, anxiety under the hood is uh, mostly norepinephrine. It's mm -hmm. cortisol and a chemical called norepinephrine. Little norepinephrine is great. That's curiosity. That's focus. That's a little bit of excitement. Um too much is massively overwhelming and you know really too much is is ocd mm -hmm. and, and those kinds of things and you have real problems but um a lot of people before a stressful situation um will use humor mm -hmm. right like tell jokes all the time try to break the ice right? try to break the mood, the, yeah. what are you doing mm -hmm. you are trying to lower anxiety levels when we laugh that's dopamine Mm. It's a different neurochemical. Dopamine is actually a flow trigger. Um, it will help us drive towards towards flow. Case in point so, of understanding the biology. We're understanding about the biology. That. So, like, hack your own biology. You people do this all the time. We so any peak performance. The funny thing about doing this is there is there's there's nothing else going on. You can't do peak performance without your biology. Like, you it doesn't matter whose book on peak performance Crucial you read. Concept, right? It's always, mm. there's the, the biology is going to be the same. I always tell people, if you're top 30% of your field, whatever that field is, you're doing a lot of the stuff that I write about in Upper, mm. Our Impossible mm. in Our Country. Maybe you don't know the language for it. Maybe you don't know that there's a right there way to do it. Behind it or the thing. science behind yeah, it. Exactly. Or the science behind it. Or the order it's supposed to happen. Mm. But you're sort of mucking mm. around with this. This is another It's example. already familiar. People telling jokes before a stressful situation. So when the stressful situation shows up, they can be more in that challenge skills mm -hmm. sweet spot we do this all the time mm -hmm. right um i just made it we made it much more of a formal practice so one of the rules was uh on the chairlift in between runs you were never allowed to talk about yourself you were never allowed <laughs> yeah. to talk about what was going on in the world because yeah. In flow, I think you quite literally said it's a good way to get punched in the face. Oh, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, if you, if you, what is it? Uh, you want I had to reread re what is it? Like you want to die times. young, talk <laughs> business with me out of chair, yeah. top flow. No, I mean, you think it's funny. I, uh, when I was living in, in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, a bunch of people there, there's a lot of scientists there. Santa, Sandia Labs are there, Los Alamos Labs are there. I did some work, Santa Fe Institute is there. Mm -hmm. I did some work with all, all three, not Sandia, 
um, but Los Alamos and, and Santa Fe Institute. But a lot of the scientists found out I had written books with Peter Diamandis, and they started the X Prize and sort of adhere to a lot of them. And they would, people started pitching me in the chairlift. They'd find out, like, a lot of the scientists knew I skied, oh, and they'd I can find imagine. me at this ski area, and I'd, like, get on a chairlift with somebody. They'd be like, oh, you're Stephen Gottler. Hey, I got this idea for a company. And I was like, I, this is not, this can't. Shoot happen. your shot, fam. This Shoot your shot. This cannot be happening in my <laughs> life. Like, and I would have to explain to people, I was like, this is what I do, so I'm not doing that, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. understand that, like, so and then Stephen just jumped off the chairlift. What, what's the best? What's the best? What's the very best way to get Stephen to never help you? Hmm. Let me think about this, right? But uh, mm. we uh, so that one of the reasons is when we're in flow, mm. the prefrontal cortex, part of your brain that's right behind your forehead, is deactivated. So your ego lives in your prefrontal mm -hmm. cortex. One of the mm -hmm. easiest ways to get it to reboot is difficult emotional processing. This is why we tell people at work, like if you're going from flowy task to flowy task, don't ever stop and check your social media in between, oh, yeah. right? Terrible, yeah. terrible for distractions, but terrible because it'll get your emotions mm -hmm. and your prefrontal cortex back involved, talking about yourself, talking about anything in the world that could scare you, anything in the world could scare you is gonna raise cortisol mm -hmm. levels and norepinephrine levels and could block that challenge skills sweet spot. So. Those were the rules on the chairlift, but we would also use a lot of humor. And the humor is a flow prime. So this is another, people do this naturally, mm -hmm. right? Like they'll try to make each other love. You see it a lot, football players in the mm -hmm. huddle, mm -hmm. crack, trying to crack each other up, soldiers right before yeah, any a Anytime they say we're out in the field right. or like, you know, on just like the most miserable experience ever, like you're hating your life, but you just still crack jokes. It's the only way to it's like, the only way to, to survive. get through it and yeah, exactly. back in. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Amazing. So, Couple examples. Um, it seems to boil down to kind of you know bring it into a lot of the concepts I talk about on the show. You know the physical self. You know, um, being a former health coach and trainer myself, I'm always fascinated by um, the physical potential of the body, the human experience, the human potential, and you know to shift from biology now to well, the body is biology, but to go more physical. Um, you talked a lot about how it seems to boil down, or I shouldn't say a lot there's a section in the book where you talk about it seems to boil down to strength and fast twitch muscle response, both naturally decline with age, but only if we're not actively training them. So my question is, how do we train both of them most effectively, strength and fast twitch? <clears throat> so it's actually, uh, those are two examples. What the research shows is you want to, it's a, uh, there's five skills that matter over time and beyond uh, strength and fast twitch. It will strength, stamina, mm -hmm. agility, which is essentially fast twitch muscle response, balance and flexibility. Mm -hmm. And the World Health Organization has very precise like we know exactly how long you should be training them. Right. And yeah. uh so once you get to I think it's fifty, um, they recommend 150 to three hundred minutes. This is for peak performance aging, mm -hmm. 150 to three hundred minutes of moderate to vigorous aerobic exercise a week, two strength days, mm -hmm. and three balance agility and flexibility days. Or, or, and this is the big hack, dynamic motion. So- Meaning what? At dynamic is a word. Like skiing. Skiing. Yeah. Tennis will work. And where, uh, mm -hmm. where you're doing strength, stamina, all those things at once, but here's a bonus. And having to move in multiple planes all the, yes. kind of the time, yeah. And here's a bonus. Not only is that, a, Physically improvement, I'll give you two examples here, but here's the first one. If you want to preserve cognitive function, what you need is neurogenesis, the birth of new neurons, right? That's, uh, that's how we fight off Alzheimer's and dementia and pre prevent cognitive decline. Anytime you have dynamic motion, when you, the brain has to coordinate strength, stamina, and balance and mm -hmm. agility when it's coordinating all those things, it it amplifies both angiogenesis and neurogenesis. Mm -hmm. So angiogenesis is the birth of new blood vessels that support the new neurons. Neurogenesis, the birth of new neurons. So wow. dynamic, so I'll give you, take it back. When they look at longevity and activity, this has been done a lot. Uh, Mayo Clinic did a big study. Join a health club, you mm -hmm. gain, and you join a health club, I think it's in your 50s, and you work out for the next 20 years, you'll gain an extra year and a half. I'll take it. <laughs> if you uh, run, it's about 3.1 years. Swimming is about 3.6. Mm. Soccer, 
you've moved to like five or six years. Really? Yeah. And I'll, we can talk about why in a second. Badminton, seven years. What? Tennis is actually nine years. And then uh, action sports, skiing, surfing, those things are about 10. So, yeah, it's great. It's, uh, it's a well, lot why, of it. Is, why is it? Why, why, why so a lot of it of is, sports? is so, so some of it is. Uh, so one of the things that really matters is, as, as we age is maintaining robust social connections mm. matters for peak performance in general. Like you want to perform at your best at any age, you need to maintain uh, robust social connections. You don't need a lot yeah. of friends, but you need some people who love you. We recently right. just had on Dr. Marcus Schultz, who was leading the current Harvard study on the longest running study of human happiness and resiliency, this 80 plus year now study. Uh, and that's exactly what yeah, you're he's about. that's the George yeah. George Valiant was yeah, the last yeah, yeah. the last guy. Yeah, there's so mm-hmm. really good data for that. For data sure. to verify and back up what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, like you know, what it was, what did uh, when they uh, when they when George Valiant wrapped this study, it, it was 80 years. Then mm-hmm. I think that yeah, I think now it's like year 82 or five. Yeah. Or something. yeah. So at 80 years, you know, the the moral was yeah, good genes are na- nice, mm-hmm. but better social connections matter more, right? Meaningful uh, relationships matter most. <laughs> you, I mean, we know good. Quality, robust social relationships, an extra seven and a half years to your life. So that's phenomenal. That's important, people. That's listen, really listen. important. But it's super important. So here's the thing that people don't realize. Any age. You want to perform mm-hmm. at your best at any age. Social relationships matter. Why is that? Because whenever the brain encounters uh, uh, an issue, could be a threat, could uh, be a challenge. Don't yeah, know, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 your brain yeah. wants to run traps like mm-hmm. is this a threat do i have a problem here or is this something a challenge i'm going to rise towards one of the things it asks is you got backup mm-hmm. are you solo because if you're solo this is a big ass problem we got to produce a lot of fear chemicals and we got to give you lots is of my energy tribe here or am i left alone out in the right. field yeah exactly or if you got people who love you people that back you up all that stuff mm-hmm. you can if you fail we're gonna pick you up you know that sort of stuff this is this is a challenge i'm gonna mm-hmm. rise for this is awesome let's do this right so um, at every level, and that challenge skills sweet spot, by the way, is also that this is going to dictate performance. Okay. And, but that challenge skills sweet spot is going to also code for the same thing. How big is that challenge? Well, are you solo or do you got friends around, right? Like that's... So am I hearing you correctly? The, the level to which this perceived new threat or challenge could actually be uh, made worse or made more or made less just by having... A meaningful connection in our life. Well, we know Quality this. Relationships. So we know this. Uh, at the, at the really, so everybody's tried to uh, work out after getting in a fight with their spouse or their girlfriend, boyfriend, mm-hmm. father, mother, right? Mm-hmm. Like you know that sort of thing. And you're suddenly like, oh my god, I'm freaking weak. What the hell happened? Right? Like we've mm-hmm. all had those kinds of experiences. I mean, sometimes you can push through and you can take all that and use it. But if you just sort of like have that fight and go to the mm-hmm. gym. You're like, oh crap! I'm not performing very, very like. There's impacts, right? We know this. Um, we just don't. We ex- we think all the impact is visible, and most of the impact is actually invisible. It's not even the stuff you're thinking Ain't about. The truth, it plays yeah. a huge, huge role. Over time, becomes even more important because part of staving off cognitive decline, you got to keep the brain sharp. Other people help us keep the brain sharp. So. Um, that's a really interesting Absolutely. one, but I'll give you, here's a, here's a mind blowing one that, that, that I love talking to people, um, who came out of the, the physical space about, because you, you'll dig this. So I'll start as a, well, you may know this cause you've read the book, but the single most important, important correlate for peak performance aging, tell them strong legs, thigh muscle mass mm-hmm. inversely correlates with one mortality because of the, the necessary bone density that correlates with it. Yeah. That, yeah so yeah. most people don't yeah, even know yeah, that yeah. there's three reasons. Yeah. Um, one is the bone density, mm-hmm. right? Because cognitive decline, the, our, our bones are the mineral factory for the body, mm-hmm. including the brain. And if you think about every brain, the brain runs on sodium, potassium, and calcium. Where do you think that calcium comes from? Your bones, fam. Right? And which are the biggest bones in the body? Your legs, well, femurs. Mm-hmm. So that's one. Two is um, when we lose uh, muscle mass, uh, we become less mobile mm-hmm. and uh, balance and agility goes. So the number one killer of older adults, if cancer doesn't get you in heart a disease, fall. a fall. Absolutely, exactly. Yeah. You're going to fall. You're going to be crushed by a secondary infection. Mm-hmm. Um, and the third thing, we just talked about the importance of social connection. When people's mobility goes, when their legs go, 
their relationships tend to follow because it's harder to maintain. I mean, we can do a lot like you online. can't get out and be social. You can't, you get out can't social. walk out. You yeah, literally yeah. can't walk yeah. around and be social. There's probably other stuff going on there uh, uh, that we don't know because the correlations are wild. Like cognitive function correlates. Cr- oh, I can strength. share with you a very personal example. Long story short, um, I suffered career ending injuries in the military. I had both of my hips reconstructed. Oh, wow. My femur on my left side, they actually take out like, like a quarter inch more than my right. Um, and so like my last year and a half, I was a patient and then on the hospital bedridden, you know, rehab kind of all that shit. Uh, everything you're saying is absolutely true. Like the leg injury, it, it's so wild now that like there's the science behind it. I just thought it was like, Oh yeah, I'm injured. I can't really do much. So of course, like who's going to want to hang out with me also, I can't go anywhere. <laughs> and so what you're talking about is very, very real, especially for me. Yeah, I think it, it's so those those two things are are really cool. And I mean, it's also a, the, the thing about it, like, you don't want to start dealing with this shit in your 50s and 60s, right? It's you don't want to have to uh, suddenly like, oh, my God, I got to build up my legs. Straight. Like mm-hmm. you want to start mm-hmm. young. You want to have that foundation. The other thing, and you know this. um. There's a so in the challenge skills sweet spot. Another thing that impacts what the challenge is is self confidence. Oddly, one of the biggest drivers of confidence is leg strength. People mm-hmm. don't realize it, but like you are way more confident when you're grounded and solid upon the earth's surface. Literally, than, literally, like literally. way more confident. Like, yeah. and I remember this because I, for years, uh, didn't work legs nearly as much as I worked upper body because the sport I was surfing and th- things like that and legs would just I figured I'd hike the dogs it, 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 I'm walking I'm, I'm on doing my feet, it I'm doing I'm it at, I'm yeah, doing yeah, it yeah, and then there was a point where I was like you know let's just actually get serious yeah, about yeah. this right like this is getting silly um and you know a year in when my legs started getting strong the biggest shift was psychological mm-hmm. right and this is me I'm a peak performance expert like I've done a lot of this work and I was like oh my god this is profound. Well, there's a lot of spillover in that. And actually, this is a big reason why I personally, uh, most guys, I think at least, you know, Monday's International Chess Day, you go hit the bench press, hit chest, whatever. I actually prefer to start my week of training with legs. Uh, and for a lot of the spillover effect here, you know, when you're training your legs, your lower body, beyond enhancing bone density, you know, it's your largest muscle groups, you know, your glutes, your quads, your hamstrings, your largest muscle groups. So what you're doing there is stimulating right out of the gate the most amount of, you know, uh, triggering HGH as yep. well. So enhance recovery, enhance mental health. I mean, HGH does a lot more oh. than just uh, building muscle and strength. You know, it does have that kind of psychological mental health spillover effect. For so sure. quick little hack there as well. That's true. That's smart, actually. Um, also, you know, it's my lifelong kind of like personal rehab <laughs> as well. Um, so kind of getting to the last couple of questions here before my final question, uh, which ones are the most most important for me here? Um, let's talk fear if we could. Yeah, please. I'm scared of this question. <laughs> you knew it was coming, right? <laughs> Sorry. Let's ta- hack flow state for fear. Um, ah! <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> if we, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if we get real with what is actually going to take, what is actually going to take to accomplish what we want at any age, there is inev- inevitably a consistent level of fear on that timeline. Again, pulling from your work here. So how do we accept, my question is, how do we accept what we are going to have to do? No, excuse me. I can't read my own text here. How do we accept that we are going to have to do things that scare us on a regular basis? So we want to get better. We want to push, tap into that 5%. We want to tap into flow state. We want to maybe embark upon this new endeavor. Um, but you know, I think any smart planner would recognize that, okay, it's going to be scary at least for a little bit, or maybe for a long term, depending on the goal here, how do we really kind of just accept that we're going to have to be cool with fear for a regular basis in order to get where we want? I or how did you? Yeah. I mean, I, so that's interesting. Um, that's an interesting question. I, let me let me back in. Let me start with with the answer and where I want to go, and then work my way there. Um, and I write about this in the art of impossible. I talk about it again in our country. Peak performers, the best of the best, use fear as a compass. 
Mm-hmm. And the reason is, so in performance across the boards, um, we have a limited energy budget in the body, right? And the biggest strain on the body's energy is always focus. Mm-hmm. The brain is 2% of our body weight, t- uses 25%, 25% of our energy, yeah. and that's at rest. This is when we're sleeping. That's at yeah, rest, yeah, yeah. right? So, we're doing jack um, shit and right. it's taking up a and quarter of taking up a quarter of it, yeah. right? So, and most of that energy, by the way, goes to paying attention. So anytime you get focused for free, that's a big deal. Ooh, right, like that's that. a really big deal. Why are intrinsic motivators, mm. curiosity, passion, purpose, why are they such a big fucking deal? What do they give us? Focus for free. I Fear like gives us focus for free. Mm. When you're scared of something, you don't have to try to pay attention to it. You can't stop paying attention to it. It happens automatically. So pop performers will always use fear as a compass, as a directional. So, And I do this both physical challenges and like I've written 14 books. Mm. Every time I write a book, there is a, there's a writing challenge in there. It's totally invisible to my audience, mm. but it scares the shit out of me. Still, Yeah, still. Every one of my books. Nar Country was, um, well, a lot of Nar Country was, could I, could I, could I make that much skiing interesting? <laughs> right. Could it be funny? Right. Like yeah. I really wanted to write a really funny book on peak uh-huh. performance also. Um, there was a bunch of stuff, but all of my books have these kind of writing challenges that scare me. And one of the reasons is because I get focused for free. Mm. So one, the first thing you need to know is there's a lot of benefit from fear. Fear is your friend. The other thing is this, as everybody knows, everything you really want is on the other side of your Right. Like say that again for them. everything you want mm-hmm. is on the other side of your fears. It's you got to go straight at the things that scare you most because the person you want to be and everything you want is on the other side of that. Mm-hmm. And that's just, it's true. I wish it wasn't true. It would make it, it would, but that's into the choir. It's, it's Absolutely. just yeah. true. Um, is, is the first part. The second part is a little bit at a time. Right. That's the other thing about like going after fears is like, you know, you chunk the things mm. down and chunk it down and chunk it down and chunk it down. So like you, you, you always want to be in that challenge skills sweet spot mm-hmm. because we know that flow is peak performance and flow like you're never going to have a better chance at like doing the thing successfully. Mm. And so, you know, well, it's not a hundred percent challenge, a 5% challenge that I need 5% greater than my skill set, Right. So you're not looking at anything huge, right? Even when I had to do really scary physical things in the book, most of them, I found a way to step up to bit by bit, by bit, by bit, by bit. You, you even kind of modeled a lot of things. A lot I, of I, kind of reading your journey was you actually didn't jump into a lot of the things you no, actually the modeled of, it. The and point built of this book was, examples. this book is a recipe book yeah, is really yeah. what it is. So like, you know, let, Everybody has a day where they wake up and they're feeling under the weather and they're scared and they're tired and they, but they have something they have to accomplish and blah, blah. Well, that's my third day on, like literally like that's, you know, these were the preconditions Mm -hmm. and this is what I did to achieve flow and peak performance on that day. Like, you know, that's one of the reasons the book is written that way. I love the realness in your, your writing and even, you know, journaling even. It seemed like a lot of this was just kind of like recollection writing but also just like you know this was this was steven on that day yeah like, I, most of the mo- by, by, most of this literally like the first draft of almost every one of these chapters was written probably right when i got back from i would get back from the yeah. mountain and i would immediately go to my desk i would take notes on yeah, everything yeah. that just happened right i might polish the notes and do everything else the next morning but like it was mm. i didn't you know sometimes i was writing things down in the car before oh, wow. you know on the on the way home so i didn't forget them. Um, so yeah, no, I tried to, tried to make it as real as possible. And I also like, I wanted it to have this recipe book mm-hmm. quality because one of the reasons I wrote it is, um, coming out of art impossible, actually the biggest questions my, my, my readers had, my fans had people that we trained at the flow research collective is like, okay, this is all the huge theory. This is how to this, but what's the application? Look right. Like, yeah. Right. And what does they it all don't, mean? Basil? And I was like, well, there's a lot of application in the art of impossible. And yeah. I was like, what do you mean? Like I, the book's filled with that. Like, and I realized that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about literally what I just said is mm. yeah. On days when I wake up and I'm like, I got in a fight with my wife and I didn't sleep very well. And, 
uh, my boss blew up the project that I'm working on and how I put it back together is going to determine my success over the next six months. What the fuck do I do mm -hmm. here? Well, you can find a very similar, you know, chapter yeah. 67 is like, is that it, right? <laughs> like that, I wrote this in a sense for- It's real world. Yeah, exactly. For, and for all the people that we train, so my, all the coaches who work for the Flow Research Collective, when they get asked those kinds of questions, they can be like, mm. well, Stephen dealt with something like that in mm. chapter whatever, and they have real world examples mm. that they can just point to, because there was, was, I don't know how, a hundred mm. different chapters. And there's, there's there were a few, there were a few, yeah. Um, actually, that kind of brings up uh, another interesting point that I think is so specific to the decade that we're in, okay. 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, with that, not only comes wisdom and experience and biology, but it also comes with every version of ourselves. It comes with every memory, every trauma. Was there ever a moment where maybe you were faced with this new endeavor that was not a matter of, I need to tap into a unique state of focus uh, or I need to understand my biology, but this is actually like, I'm coming to the top of this mountain with some shit 20 years ago. Was there ever like a, oh a my God. scary memory, traumatic event that like presented that you then need to, you need to think now. Well, so, I mean, one of you asked why park is game. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is I had massively unfinished business. Cause when I started my career, I started out as a journalist and I chased professional athletes around mountains for a mm -hmm. decade. So if you are not a professional athlete and you chase professional athletes around mountains, across oceans, what do you think happens? Mm. It's terrifying. Mm. It's awful. Mm. Um, I broke so many bones, but like we were laughing about it recently. A couple of days ago, I was with uh, another one of the early journalists who I helped start Freeze Magazine, the very first sort of extreme ski magazine. So I've like very familiar with this world. There was no writer on staff at Freeze who did not get PTSD on a story. Hmm. All got PTSD covering professional athletes. It always makes me wonder, like, the videographers and cameramen out there watching, you know, filming, like, documentaries and extreme sports. I'm like, are you also oh, yeah. an X they, Games athlete? Yeah, like, how yeah, the fuck I mean, you do like, we, th those are, those are, those are the, those are my friends. Those yeah. are the, yeah, they're um, astounding. Especially the cameramen, they're skiing the same goddamn things as the <laughs> pros are. Yeah, with yeah. 50 pounds and on And they just back. got there. Like, right? they, they don't have the park yeah. experience. Yeah, so... It was one, I got my ass handed to me mm, for a decade, okay. right? Like for, I mean, I broke so many bones. I was terrified. So you kind of wanted to like revisit it like on your own terms. I, yes, yeah. I had unfinished business. And that was, part of it was, uh, you know, I, I think having a mission is really crucial. So in Art and I talk about there are three tiers of goal setting. Mm -hmm. Humans perform best when we have mission level goals, uh, high heart goals, which are mission level goals are lifetime goals. Mm. I want to be a great writer. High heart goals are the three to five year goals that we have to accomplish on our way to our mission level. Goals. The smaller so like, rocks. I wrote a book yeah. about cooking. I wrote, I've got a degree in writing or, you know, those are the smaller steps. And then clear goals, the day to day, mm. the to do list, right? That feed into our, mm. and humans perform best when all three are pointed in the same direction. But it also turns out that when all three are actualized in a mission, mm. That's the most potent thing you can do. And ask anybody, like, I started thinking about it because so is journalists, right? Like, I was a journalist, and it didn't matter who I was in my normal life. If you gave me an assignment, I would do anything to get the story. I mean, like, I've sailed through monsoons mm -hmm. with pirates. Oh, I've shit. done, like, I've done stuff where, like, I shouldn't have lived. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have lived. I shouldn't have lived. I shouldn't have lived at all. And you look back, and you're like, I just did it because, like, they gave me an assignment. Yeah, I was poor and I wanted the, but, <laughs> like, it was just like, I, they gave me a mission. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? I was on the mission. And people, we're all like that. It's not, there's nothing unique to me. There were, most of us are wired that way. So if you can get your goals together into a mission, but you, the mission has got to have that little extra something. So, yes, I wanted to learn to park ski because it would prove that all this new science is right and the, all the old science was wrong and blah, blah, blah. But the other thing was, I had unfinished business with the jocks from my childhood who I got into fights with all through my childhood. So there's the history right. I'm talking about. It was about, that like history. Right? And then you. I chased, you know, Elliot's around for a decade and mm. still like was found wanting, mm. right? And in a sense, and so like there was a lot of stuff there. So you asked why well, Parks, one of the reasons was because I had so much unfinished business and you want that. That's, 
extra motivation mm-hmm. that's extra fuel and you know it's free focus right it's free focus yeah. and it's a, right and it it's a reason you know it i skied 88 days mm-hmm. in that season and you know it is hard and every time i went to the mountain i was scaring the shit out of myself right like i was mm-hmm. doing i was there to do something that scared me psychologically that's like trying to do, you you know yeah. trying to do something that difficult and it was over a you know seven month period that's a long time to be scared all the time you need that kind of mission to keep going or i did i i love that answer and i think fear um fear is absolutely one of the free um ingredients in the recipe for flow state and success if we're willing to just first of all i think you have to accept that but then choose to show up to it every day um, but also another concept you talked about is um, creativity, kind of wrapping up, getting towards the end here. Um, creativity, what role does that have in, you know, growing old and staying rad? You know? So we talked about those if-then moderators, mm-hmm. right, that you need to take care of to unlock these superpowers of aging. So in your 50s, if you, right, we talked about what you have to do up to your mm-hmm. 50s, forgiveness in your 50s actually have to engage in creativity if you want to unlock all these superpowers creative activities it doesn't matter what they are coding cooking writing painting painting okay you know Just dancing any creative, to any creative thing um and i mean you drive to work on a new route that's creativity as well mm-hmm. right so there's mm-hmm. lots of big and small but it's that kind of thinking that actually is what unlocks uh, these cognitive superpowers that become art. So you had matters. Interesting. Yeah, you can't oh. get act. It's something about the the way that multi perspectival thinking works. Um, you need sort of creative thinking to sort of train the brain to do all that stuff. Well, that also kind of ties back into neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, you know, and, and neural crosstalk. Like we need to do things to activate the brain in different ways. Totally. To keep it talking yeah, and, and like keep to it, get different parts it, talking keep it to fresh. it. Yeah. The other thing, the other reason creativity matters so much here, bonus, it's a flow trigger. Hmm. So uh, mo- a lot of flow triggers, we mentioned this earlier, work by driving dopamine into our system. That's mm-hmm. how they drive focus. And so risk is a flow trigger because it drives dopamine. Novelty yeah. is a flow trigger because it right. drives dopamine. Complexity, when we sort of gaze up at a night sky and see like an infinite number of stars and most of those stars are galaxies and suddenly we're looking at geological time, we get awe, Mm -hmm. right? That's complexity, Mm -hmm. that's the front edge of a flow state, that's a flow trigger. Pattern recognition, when we link ideas together Mm -hmm. in a novel way, that's a creative trigger. And this could be an athlete uh, as a skier. If I look at a terrain feature or a mound of snow and go, oh, that's perfect for a, you know, flat spin 360 or whatever. That's mm-hmm. not actually a trick. I made that up. It's <laughs> two trick to push to get a flat spin. It is, it is now. It is now. Yeah. It's not, that's not actually a real thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, that's pattern recognition, mm-hmm. but it's also when we tell a joke and we, that, right. That's how the dopamine you get from that's pattern mm-hmm. recognition or you get a, do a crossword puzzle, you get an answer, right? That little rush of pleasure you get. That's dopamine. That's this is why my mom loves, uh, Sudoku, Sudoku yeah. and Bejeweled and yeah, exactly. words with friends it's, so much. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's those, it's, it's dopamine. Mm. And, um, anything that produces dopamine acts as a flow trigger. So, uh, creativity mm. is a flow trigger and really, really, really useful one, right? You can sort of, stack creative decision on top of creative mm-hmm. decision on top of creative decision is a really smooth entrance way into flow. In fact, um, we do a lot of work with uh, retiring spec ops mm. folks, that community. We've done a lot of work with that community in particular. As you can kind of imagine, being special forces, doesn't matter, you know, you could be a ranger, you could be a SEAL, whatever. Beret, mm. Green Beret, um, it's a very high flow job, mm. right? Um, and when people leave the service, um, besides the brotherhood, the social connection, mm. all the sense of purpose, all we, the things we you lose get, our mission. You, lo- you lose the mission, you also lose all that flow. Mm. And the combination, and, and we're working on this with uh, SOCOM, I'm working on articles on it and papers on it and everything else, so I'm not just speaking out of my butt here. Um, the, one of the reasons you have such a high suicide rate among, mm-hmm. like if you look at the spec ops communities, when you measure their stress levels on duty, they're actually through the roof. They're way higher than other forces, but they get PTSD 
much less while active duty, but loss, which is late onset mm. uh, stress syndrome, it's PTSD, but it shows up like five years after you left the service, Interesting. is incredibly common, mm. um, especially with spec, spec ops. And it's because one, the mission mm. goes away, but two, there's no more flow. Mm. So how do you, or we get the same problem with retiring professional action adventure sport yeah, athletes, or even yeah, just yeah. straight up athletes. Mm -hmm. What do we suggest? What's the best? Often one of the best ways, one, you have to double down on, for especially with, with people coming out of the military community, group flow really matters, mm. right? Group flow activities really, really matter because that's what you got. So you mm. have to, you know, that's really important, that closeness, but creativity. Mm. So if you can find like group creative activities together, group action adventure sports that are creative, and those are the things that work the absolute best because creativity is close to risk in terms of the, how it produces dopamine in the brain and it's a really great substitute so uh random quick question do you much do you know sean lake mm -mm. no uh just kind of hear what you're talking about reminds me uh so he's um you know glenn doherty uh, heard of the bubs foundation mm -hmm. he was uh, one of the operators who died in the benghazi attack sure. um well him and sean are like lifetime friends best friends mm -hmm. sean's a former i think pro or semi-pro snowboarder uh, they run a, an amazing organization called the Glenn Doherty Foundation down out of um, San Diego area uh, that's all for this, transitioning spec ops members back into uh, civilian work um, through such modalities and experiences so that... Brian, who's sitting off camera right yeah, over yeah. there, right? Um, for years before, uh, we stole with the Flow Research Collective worked with the army and disabled vets, like mm -hmm. people who gotten injured and use same protocols using I wonder if you were in where I was. I was in this unit called the Warrior Transition Unit, WTU, uh, in Fort Sam Houston in Texas. There's another one in Walter Reed in DC where like all, you know, if you get severely broken, that's where you, that's go, where you go to rehab and or facilitate enhanced transition services, yeah. Were you guys there? Was it, does WTU ring a bell? No. No, okay. Um, we have, though uh, I have been, I've done a lot of stuff with folks at Walter Reed. Okay, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's a whole nother conversation, but um, Stephen, I just gotta say, man, y your work um, in everything up to NAR country has been a huge influence in my life. And, and my you're just super disappointed in the work because of NAR <laughs> no, country. No, no. Right? So, but I was going to say, I'll be better. I love the variety and the, the kind of the tempo change in NAR country. Thank you. Um, and I honestly, I didn't know going into it, it was going to be so, Oh, this is just, I'm reading Stevens like ski journals, but, <laughs> um, but when I kind of changed my, my approach to it was, okay, <laughs> this chase, this is for you in, you know, 10 years, 20 years, this is an opportunity for, for me as a 37 year old or anybody listening to you know, a 27 year old, 17 year old to tap into experience and wisdom and biology that we can extract and apply here and now, but prepare the future self for. And also Paradise real world. Self. And don't be like, one, like, I wanted to like remove, I, you know, I was younger. I was worried about what was going to happen. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm was more concerned at 55, mm. but like that's for me, those fears set up early, right? Like, mm. um, and I would have loved, if somebody would have given me this book yeah. around like age 30, exactly. I would have been like, oh, thank God. Yeah, oh, freaking thank and God. We're gonna give someone this book. So if you make oh, yeah, this we far, are. we're gonna have you know, down in the show notes or video notes. Uh, we got a signed copy ready for you. Um, but I gotta ask my final question, please. Um, ever forward, living a life ever forward. When you hear those words, what does that mean to you? So this may be a lame answer, but I like there's no right or wrong. Okay, answer. so because we talked about this a lot, but when I hear it more than anything else, I'm thinking about the challenge because sweet spot. I'm thinking about making sure that every day you're showing up and you're pushing mm. right outside your comfort zone. I always, to put it differently, I say this in Art Impossible, I demonstrated in our country, peak performance. Remember, it's just getting our biology work for us rather than against us. If you look at it, it's about six, seven things you want to do every day, maybe six, seven things you want to do every week. It's not a ton, right? This is really achievable by mm. most people. The trick is you know is people always ask me uh hey what are the three things i can do monday morning right and my answer is always the same fuck you <laughs> fuck you there is no three things you can do monday i mean like what are you freaking kidding me what are we 10 like first of all the point is you've got to do three things monday 
Tuesday, mm. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, repeat. Forever. Forever. Yeah, exactly. Forever. Forever. <laughs> right? So, like, peak performance is a checklist. The good mm. news. The bad news, you got to show up every day for that checklist. Mm. That's what you're doing. And most important on that checklist, in my opinion, is the challenge skills sweet spot. You got to show up every day to push yourself. That's your job. Your job isn't to like compare yourself to anybody outside you. It's not to goal set by anybody else's standards. You know where that challenge skills sweet spot is. You know exactly how much is pushing yourself right outside your comfort zone. And that's your job on a daily mm. basis. So like Ooh. when I think about Ever Forward, like that. that's what I think about. I think about like doing that job and the point, one of the reasons I wrote this, if I were to sum it up in a phrase is somebody asked me this the other day and I was like, I am so tired of meeting people who are dead before they're dead. Oof. I am so sick of it and yeah, yeah. so sick of meeting people in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Forget people my age. That's a given. Mm -hmm. But like 20, 30, 40 years younger than me. Than me and I'm like, right? I am so mm -hmm. tired of that. Um, so that's what I think when I think ever, ever forward. Uh, I love that interpretation. It reminds me of uh, this book I was sharing with you that I was reading around the same time as uh, Recapture the Rapture with your guy, Jamie. Um, the Immortality. Oh, fuck. Immortality Key. Or immortality, immortality Code. I'll figure it out in the post. Um, but it's, um, if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. And it's this concept of, you know, really they're mm -hmm. talking about you know, ego death and this kind of alter state of consciousness that we can find in a lot of different ways. But um, I feel like that's kind of like the other side of what you're talking about. That, you know, so many people, you know, I say sleepwalking, but you know, you're dead before you ever die. But if you can figure out how to die before you die, then when you die, you don't die. That's an ego death thing. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. We're, I think we're talking about like a soul death. Or yeah, yeah. I don't want yeah. So I'll have to go back and cut my part out. <laughs> I digress, but it just kind of sparked that, uh, different right. kind of connection. There's no such thing yeah. as a bad tangent. We, we like go. all tangents. Especially not with you. I'm picking Especially up on that, that for be. sure. Especially if we can make yeah. a joke out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can be laughing. I'm good. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. 